Well, hello, fellow Amatan Radio enthusiasts, and welcome to this episode 243 of the ICQ Amatan Radio podcast, a special additional episode which brings to you more of our interviews recorded at the Friedrich Schaven Ham Radio Show, which took place uh, a couple of weekends ago in Germany. This is uh, what we're going to be calling the Manufacturer Edition, and uh, this episode will be covering uh, interviews from Yesu Kenwood, Flex, Elecraft, and Icom, as recorded by Martin M1MRB, Chris, Mike Zero, Tango, Charlie Hotel, and Ed DD5 Lima Papa. Hope you enjoy, guys. I'm with uh, Paul. G3WYW here at Free It's Heaven and uh, Paul works for Yesu and Paul is going to give us some announcements for, from uh, Yesu. Thank you Michael, uh, Martin, it's nice to, nice to be here again. As I've said to you before, uh, Free It's Heaven is a very important show to us because it's an opportunity to showcase our new products in the European market. We have a couple of new things that are quite interesting that I think might be of interest to your users. The first one, I think, is our new M100 microphone. Yeah, certainly um, looks the business. It is. There are two versions of it, the M1 and the M100. The M1 has got a very nice graphic equalizer, which enables you to tune the audio response of the microphones, because it's got two built into it, to suit the conditions under which you're using it. Like, you can have it nice and wide for chatting on uh, 80 meters in the afternoon, or you can tighten it up and boost the frequencies that enable you to punch through the pileups uh, in a DX contest. Yeah. Um, it's very nice. It's got a voice recorder in it as well. So it's a very nice product. It's new and it looks and, and operates extremely well. So, so you mentioned the voice recorder. Does that mean that I can uh, use it in a contest, record uh, my CQ you and call something? absolutely on? can do that. That's exactly right. And you can sit and just press the button and oh, <laughs> it saves life. your voice. <laughs> A lot of our modern radios, of course, have got voice recorders built in, yeah. but those that haven't, you can use that function on them as well. That, that's certainly, and, and it's probably got a slightly longer recorder, I would guess, than what's in some of the radios, maybe? Uh, yes, I think it's around about 20, 30 seconds, something like which that. Is good. Yeah. Which is good, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it looks a really good piece of kit, and if somebody wants a... a and actually, I, it is, it's 20 seconds of recording. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sorry, sorry, I put you a little bit on the spot there, Paul. Okay. <laughs> I looked at the leaflet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, what else have we got? Well, the other thing that's quite interesting is 5 megs. Yeah. We've had 5 megs available for quite some time in our products, mainly for the UK market, where the UK um, Ofcom have allocated a number of different channels, but and some European countries have also done the same. They certainly have. But yeah. at, uh, at the WRC 15, the World Radio Congress in 2015, they allocated a 60 meter amateur band, which yeah, is between yeah. 5351.5 and 5366.5, with multiple modes. So right. CW, yeah. SSB, RITI, DATA, and the rest of it. And Yesu looked at this and thought that maybe there was an opportunity here that we could perhaps rationalize our operation across our products right. and provide that capability. So we, they started work, and I'm very pleased to announce that we have now got that software available, and it will be available to download from the Yesu.com website in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. So it's a lot of work you guys have done yes, if you're releasing <laughs> for multiple radios. Uh, yes, and this, this, is the, this covers the FTDX 5000, FTDX 3000, FTDX 1200, the FT991A, and the FT891. Yeah. Th those radios can have it done by the user simply by downloading the software, plugging the appropriate cable into the back of their radio, and, and applying, doing the yeah. Vulcan death grip on the radio to make it into the right mode to do that, and away it goes. Yeah. Um, the FT817 also can have this software, but it requires the radio to be returned to a authorized service center for that to be installed, but it's, it's okay. The FT450 and the FT857 are unlikely to have this modification. Yes, yeah, um, Because in the case of the 450, there are some hardware design changes that would need to be done, and it's just not... Well, I, I know when the, years ago when we had the extension to the 40-meter uh, band, I was working with uh, Mr. Lynch at the time, and uh, I did a number of the modifications. And for most amateurs, they didn't want to go in and change the little diodes on an 817 to say it's something you've got to be skilled at. So the implementation of this is once the radio has been upgraded to the firmware, the user can then switch between a UK 
broadband plan for five megs because of course we still in the UK have all those different channels yeah um, or the European one which gives you the and in the UK versions of course now you can use the different modes lower sideband upper sideband Ricky data and also but it is the responsibility of the user in all cases to make sure they're operating within the terms and conditions well, of their license. license and of course if your country has not ratified WRC 15 you can't use the frequencies yeah. so the user we're giving you the capability of taking advantage of five megs in the, to the best of your ability and our radios can do that so that's an exciting uh, five megs is an interesting band you can have pan-european contacts at most times of the day and night and uh, and it works really well and there's quite a lot of activity and i was pleasantly surprised when i was testing some early versions of the firmware as to how well it worked so it's good so that's that's good news so that's bringing together the uh, 60 meter band five five megs across most of the yesu rigs and bringing it into line with uh, current regulations indeed absolutely but the, you know it's important that the users remember that they must check that they operate that they operate within the terms of the conditions of their license in in their country. Yeah. So Paul and I are not giving Paul and I are not giving you carte blanche to do what you want. <laughs> We're definitely not doing that. <laughs> okay. Moving on. <laughs> we have another radio, which is a new handheld, the FT70D, which is a entry level C4FM dual band transceiver, um, digital transceiver. It has like all these small radios it's got a, a fairly small display but does have a full keypad uh, with buttons on it it has a very interesting function in terms of instead of showing the dis uh, the mode that you're operating whether it's fm yeah. or c4 fm you know you work the mode out by the different colored leds yeah there are two and when you're in fm mode yeah. they're both green when you're in C4 FM mode, one is blue. Yeah. And the gr when you go to transmit, the green LEDs become red. Yeah. So in FM transmit, it's two red LEDs. In FM receive, it's two green. In C4 FM, it's green and blue if you receive, yeah. and it's red and blue if you're in transmit. So it's an interesting way of using yeah. LEDs to indicate the mode that you're operating in. Well, that's the that's the same as the uh, FTDM 100 I have in the car, and uh, so it's the same light. So you, you're you're obeying the same principles. And trust me, guys, the different color LEDs are very very useful, especially when you got the uh, the volume turned down. You can say, oh, that's a digital call coming through or something. So it's 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 a good system, I'd say, Paul. Yeah, it it also has a uh, five watts output and uh, is obviously a fairly rugged construction. Yeah. The keypad is normal, but there's one thing that anybody who looks at it will see, and that's that it hasn't got a wires X. I was about to ask you about that. There's no wires X button. How am I going to do that? Right, because what this, brings in, this brings us to a new function, which is do with our new DR2, which I'll be talking about in a minute, which has got a different method of linking repeaters together using what we call digital groups. C4FM of course is a digital modulation system yeah. and provides a way of communicating via digital. Up till now we've used C4FM synonymously with wires X. Yeah, we have. And so you had a you could either have an internet gateway of your, at your own home with an HRI 200 and a PC and a handheld or a mobile connecting to that and using that on the wires network. And you could also link that by means of a DR1 yeah. to provide C4 FM repeater option within your repeater. Mm -hmm. And then if you connected the DR1 to the internet by means of an HRI 200, you then had wires X activity available to go through the repeater and out onto the network and talk to anybody else who was like that. Well, guys, after uh, chatting to Paul uh, Bigwood, uh, G3WYW, we've had uh, a little bit of an update now on the uh, DR2 repeater. So I'm going to get Paul to give us a bit more of an update on it uh, and uh, bring you up to date on that one. So, Paul, what's happened in the last few weeks? Thank you, Martin. It's uh, it's interesting. We've had a, a couple of developments in the DR2, that, uh, or clarifications, I should say, that have made it clearer what it will do. First of all, the DR2 is very similar to the DR1 in that it looks the same. It's got the same form factor. But it is a dual-mode, dual-receive 
C4FM digital repeater. Let's go. All right. So it's a, it's dual band, dual receive C4FM FM digital repeater. One of the differences between it and the DR2 is, first of all, it has an additional receiver, which gives you effectively an up channel for the repeater controller to do emergency messages or priority channel changes and control, things like that, which the DR1 doesn't have. But the other thing it does have is this IMRS board, which is Internet Linked Multi-Site Repeater System, which gives you the ability to link a couple, more than one, DR2s together without the need for a, a central server. So you could literally connect them, plug two into a, a, a hub or a router, and, uh, and connect the two together. And you'd be able to transfer traffic voice and data traffic across the network between these two. The DR2 supports both FM and C4FM in exactly the same way as the DR1 does, right. in that it uh, has this AMS mode, automatic mode selection, or, uh, which enables people with analog FM transceivers to communicate with those with digital by the repeater converting the um, the uh, digital signal into an FM signal that the FM user can receive. That works in exactly the same way. Right. The, the addition, one of the additions to the DR2 is this function called DG and DP. Now, DG is the digital group identifier and DP is the digital personal identifier. Right. The, this is a new function within System Fusion. Now, digital group and digital personal identifications are a way of identifying a particular broadcast. And the analogy is, to you, is, is, is of CTCSS in the analog world right. uh, for the DG. So the DG, digital group ID, is similar in function to an analog CTCSS tone. Right. So yeah. you can assign a DG to a repeater, to a DR2 repeater, and users to access that repeater would need to use the DG group associated with that repeater to access it. Mm -hmm. Whereas we had 32, typically 32 CTCSS groups available, they're up to 99 available in the digital group function so it obviously and a repeater obviously will support more than one actually will support up to 95 of them so you can have different digit different groups on the repeater so you could have one for the local repeater you could have one for a, a local interest group sorry within that repeater and a different one for another group there is one dg group zero zero which is an all call which goes to everybody so it's like a general call type thing but the details are not yet finalized, but the principle is that you'll be able to use DGs to link repeaters as well. Yeah. So if you have um, a number of repeaters connected by means of the IMRS, and I'll talk about that in a minute, you can assign a DG, a digital group, to a particular repeater, another repeater. So somebody coming in on repeater A, will be using this particular DG, I don't know, 55 or some number, that will go across the network to the other repeater. Yeah. And then, so it enables you then to make a call to that repeater. This is, the, the analogy here, of course, is what we were trying to do, or we tried to do for years in analog repeaters, linking them together. Mm -hmm. So you have a 70 cents repeater and a two meter repeater, perhaps in a, in, 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 a, in a town, and you want to have an ability to link them together. And that was usually done by means of DTMF tones to open up the gateway, as it were, to the other repeater. Well, this idea of DGs does exactly the same thing. Yeah. And the other, the other one, the, the DP that I mentioned is a digital personal one. That's um, an individual ID, which is very similar to a five-tone cell call. So it, it could be, it can be alphanumeric as far as I understand. So it could be your call sign. And so if I entered your call sign onto the screen of the radio as a DP number yeah. of my radio, and then I press the button, assuming you're within range of the repeater that I was calling or 
within the range of the repeater that might have been might be connected to this network, then I would be able to contact you. Yeah. So that that's the principle of those. So the details are not all finalized yet, but those are the basic principles of how this will work. Now, so you got other, so you kind of got personal point to point contact uh, effectively by putting, for I can say, my call sign in. You and I would have a pro. There's nothing private on RF, but pretty much a semi-private call because all other radios would ignore it because it wasn't uh, directed Correct. at my yes. call sign. And of course, if if you sh- if a number of users have the same DG, yeah. then of course they're in a they're they're in a net effectively, and they're just talking to each other. The other the other bit that's interesting is the fact that the DR2 does of course support wires X, um, both over the air and as we understand it through the hri 200 although that plugged into the back which is just the same way as we do it with the dr1 although that functionality is being tested at the moment and is not yet fully defined but it will will be available yes yeah. view has always been that the best way to connect wires to a repeater is via rf so from a local gateway station connecting up to the repeater and then relaying it out that way. True. That's the best way that we think of doing it because it it negates the necessity to have a PC and a router and all that kind of stuff and an internet gateway of some sort, a broadband up at the repeater site, which, of course, might be on the top of a hill and not exactly the best place (laughs) or easiest place to get a, 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 um, a broadband connection to. So connecting by RF is by far and away the preferred method IMRS is is a very board that plugs into the back of the DR2 and has a, a RJ45 network connection, and you can plug that with a normal cable into a router or a hub or with a suitable uh, reversing thing. You can plug them two repeaters together. You don't need to have anything in the way of a server to transfer data between these two repeaters. Uh, the details of the IMRS are not yet finalized, but that's sort of the way it will work. It doesn't. The big key thing is it doesn't need to have any kind of server connected to it, a central server like Wires does. You're right. So that does create the ability for groups of amateurs to in a in a town or an area or a county to connect their DR2s together to create their own private linked network. Yeah. Yeah, and obviously just passing RF traffic uh, over the internet between those uh, repeaters. Well, know. yes, it goes. It actually goes from RF down into a digital into C four FM, and then goes across the network and back out again. Yeah, yeah. We're not sure yet whether FM traffic will go across that way. Um, announcements are made, but I think what I've told you today is the, is the principles of what the way that it will work in general terms. There may well be some. Slight changes, but uh, nothing significant. Yeah. Well, in, in fairness, Paul, you've given us some more of an update. You, you gave us like pretty much pre-release update at, at Free Hall, and you've given us clarified a few things just today. And with any new product, there are often uh, firmware upgrades and changes in specification to improve things. And you know, you're Indeed. a company; you you improve things along the way, as Indeed. as you have. The other thing I should mention, of course, just quickly, Paul, is that. The DG and the DP functions are, of course, a, a new part. And, and all existing radios, or most of the existing radios, I should say, of our C4 FM radios will mm-hmm. be upgraded. There will be firmware upgrades for them um, over the, the coming weeks that will enable them to take advantage of these. The only one that does it at the moment is the, is the FT-70. But right. that's just on And the DR2 hasn't yet been uh, avail- isn't yet available. So in time, you know, the FT2Ds, the FTM400s and the other models will be, have firmware updates available to support the DG and the DP functions of System Fusion. Well, that, that's, uh, that's good news, Paul. That, that's good news. And you've certainly clarified it for us. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, okay, Martin. Lovely. Thanks. Bye-bye. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now.
For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. OK, so we're joined by Mark Haynes from, from Kenwood. Mark's course on his M0 DXR. So, Mark, we last spoke to you back in Newark last year. And at the time, you just uh, introduced your new flagship handheld, the TH D74. So how's that, how's that been going? Yes, nice to speak to you again, Chris. Yep, the THD74 has proved a wonderful success. We've been shocked, I think is probably the right word. We've achieved amazing sales all around the world with the THD74. I think people are very interested in trying D-Star. So we've sold the radio to many people who have yet to discover D-Star. And the radio, of course, also offers the traditional analog uh, FM capability but also has the wonderful receive capability on CW and sideband all the way from HF up to UHF. So there are a number of features there which appeal to people and I think is now a point where it's people are realising that the price is very much justified. Okay, cool, that's good. And you were telling me earlier, Mark, there's, a, there's an anniversary coming up of Kenwoods. So maybe you've got some, uh, I think there's a product coming out around that, is that right? We're celebrating 70 years So we have the 70th anniversary version of the TS590SG, uh, which has the extension E2 model. So this is a a very nice black edition of the 590SG, which is in production during the month of August. So we expect it to be available from September. The radio is exactly the same inside the box, except we have some appealing features on the external chassis. So I can see you've got some gold highlights and things, and it's a nice black black cover so we have a limited edition coming to the uk and europe it has a gold finish on the vfo and also the logo and the model name is in a gold the radio has a a black chassis so it offers also a a unique serial number for a limited edition so it will be a very nice addition to um, a kenwood fan collection if you're a kenwood collector that's the one to get and i presume there are not many out there so i presume if you want to get one get your order in soon yeah you need to be very quick and also with every purchase of the uh, ts590 sg e2 model we are offering a free jacket to mark the 70th anniversary as well so but i won fast excellent (laughs) okay so that's excellent thanks for that mark and then finally yesterday you were quickly showing us your TS480, and it's attached to, well, when I say TS480, the front panel of a TS480, which is atta- it's attached to a black box, it's, it's missing parts. What, what's that about, Mark? So this is a very exciting development, which I've discovered recently. The TS480 is, in fact, a fantastic radio for operating remote, and I've teamed up with Remote Rig, a Swedish company, who offer remote solutions. And this is, of course, very useful for people who have antenna restrictions, at their home QTH or perhaps people who are traveling on the move and would like to continue to operate their home station. So the TS480 head unit is attached to a remote rig black box. You can either connect using ethernet or Wi-Fi and it allows you to connect to the other half of the radio, the main body of the radio, which is co-located with the antenna and operate the radio over the internet. And this is a fantastic solution. I've, I've been exploring it now for about a week and it works very well. Um, you need a, a half decent internet connection which will allow you to operate the radio as normal. And uh, I've uh, been able to turn the radio on here and hook up to our Kenwood HQ station back in London and operate the big antennas there. So it's That's cool. a really so you, nice solution. You hotel then on the Wi-Fi. What, I can't, what I'm not seeing here is a computer. I presume this is just a black box that goes straight to the internet. Is no laptop required or anything else? A computer's else? not needed for this. And I personally prefer to operate a radio. I like to use a panel of a radio rather than a screen yeah. and for people who have the same attitude and approach this is an excellent solution because yeah, i've seen some solutions where you actually have a, a kind of software version of the, yeah, of this the front is, panel yeah this is possible but as i say my preference is to actually use a radio itself so that's where this device comes in and the ts480 is ideal for that you have two versions of the 480 to choose from the one the ts480 sat which has the built-in atu or the ts480 hx which is the 200 watt model and uh, it has the detachable head and also a speaker built into the head unit, so it's ideal for this concept. Cool, that sounds very interesting, Mark, and I'm sure that will uh, interest a lot of people, you know, especially, like you say, those that travel or those that have that have those restrictions. Okay, Absolutely. well, that's, th- that's great, Mark. Thanks very much for your time, and good luck. If you want to contact Kenwood, what's the, uh, the best way to do that, if you want to get more information? Well, uh, anyone can search for me on qrz.com, M0DXR. Alternatively, you can send me an email direct to Kenwood, mark.haines.com at uk 
www.jvckenwood.com. I'd be happy to assist anybody who has any questions. That's great. Thank you, Mark. And uh, we'll see you in the next show. Thanks very much. Cheers. Well, I'm here in Freakshaven still. I'm with Gerald uh, Youngblood, K5SDR. Hi, Gerald. Hi. And uh, we saw you two years ago, and a lot's happened with uh, Flex Radio in the last two years. You've got lots of new things on the stand, so please tell us about some of them. Okay, first of all, uh, this May in Dayton, Ohio, we announced the new 6,400 and 6,600 radios. Yeah. And they uh, now integrate a product that we came out with a year ago, which is Maestro, into the, the radio. So you have a complete standalone radio, SDR, direct sampling, without the need for a computer. That's brilliant. Because I, I remember seeing, it was about two years ago, you were previewing the Maestro. Right. And uh, that looked good, but this right. really does look good having it uh, built on. So, so if somebody wanted a more conventional style radio, right, the display in the box is good, I would suggest. That's what this gives you, and not only that, it has the most powerful display of any radio that's ever been on the market in that it has an 8-inch touchscreen yep. uh, display that has a resolution of 1920 by 1200 which right. is, uh, you can see it on the HDMI, it yeah. can directly drive an HDMI monitor in that resolution, so yeah. it's not a compromised display like you'll see in, in a lot of radios. Yeah, yeah. so that's very good. As Gerald says, behind he has a, uh, an HDMI monitor, a uh, large, about 37-inch screen, uh, and it looks as crisp on that as it does on the display on the front of the, the radio itself. So yeah. really good, and uh, as I say, for those of you, who needs uh, the bigger screen? Yeah. You've co sorted that. Right. So in addition to that, the new 6600 mm -hmm. model allows you to digitize two antennas at once. Right. You could, for example, have a six meter beam and a tri-bander. Yeah. And you can have two pan adapters. You can have six meters here and you can have 20 meters there. Right. Or if you're a contester, you can operate two bands at once. You could be on 40 meters and 20 meters. You could be calling CQ on 20 while you're listening on 40 without it muting the radio, as long as you have good antenna isolation. Well, that's good. That's good. That's, good. That, that's really interesting. I mean, I'm not a contester myself, but I yeah. know contesters who love that feature. Yeah. In, in fact, we're, uh, we're sending to Bouvet, which is the number two most wanted uh, de-expedition anywhere yeah. in the world, uh, we're sending uh, a dozen radios there, a dozen maestros and 6500s plus amplifiers yeah. to Bouvet, which is the most remote island on earth. Right. And that'll be early 2017. So that's, that's new. Yeah. Of course, since two years ago, we had Maestro came out. You can see it down here. Yeah. And what's new there is we're actually running remote operation from the U.S. We have stations in the U.S. Maestro is running a yeah. station in North Carolina. Here you see a PC running a station in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. And uh, we had an iPad here earlier. I don't see it right now, but we were running a station in Austin on an iPad. But Last night I was sitting at the hotel listening to local broadcast station, yeah. medium wave station at home in Austin from my uh, sipping a beer right here in Germany and, and uh, real time listening to my station in, at home. They're making so, it too easy for yeah. us. <laughs> but yeah, it's very interesting <laughs> to be able to see a remote uh, remote station being worked uh, in the States from here And you here can see it, it's real time. The display yeah. is real time. You can't tell that it's uh, that it's remote. And, and appears to be no sluggishness of the display. It's instant. It's uh, yeah, pretty fact, much. You as, can see uh, I can click tune. I can tune the spectrum yeah. display yeah. just like you were sitting at the. Just like you're sitting at home. So that, that's brilliant. It's very easy to set up too. What yeah. you do is with the new. This software will be out in the next couple of weeks. Right. It's called uh, version two of our Smart SDR, and it includes Smart Link, which you see showing up right here. I do. That's the, uh, we call it Smart Link because it's very easy to set up. All right. You basically register your radio with our server. Yeah. And you can create a login, which can be a, a, your own login. I use Google login. I use my Google, you can use Facebook as your yeah. login. Right. And you register your radio by pushing the push to talk, and it tells our, our server where you are. When you bring up your iPad, iPhone, or Maestro, 
you, uh, it will go to the server and it will see what radios you're allowed to use. All and right. you just click on the radio in and a few you seconds, go. you're up. And that's what you see. That's brilliant. That's, uh, that's really good. That is, as I say, really impressive. I'm, I'm quite impressed at all. You also said you've got a new uh, cloud warmer or two. Yeah, we've amplifier. got a kid. If you walk on down here, you can see it there. Yeah. It's um, two kilowatts, a real two kilowatts. So right. it's legal limit with lots of headroom in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, it, you can run RTTY and dueling CQs in a contest, which means that's your worst case condition, and it'll yeah. stay at 1,500 watts. It has the latest heat sink technology in it that distributes the heat. It has a maximum efficiency algorithm yeah. that if you're running RTTY or CW, the efficiency is around 70%. So That's it good. keeps the cooling yeah. down, uh, load downs considerably. Yeah, so no frying eggs on it tonight. No, <laughs> we want to warm the clouds, <laughs> not the box. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You'll have to excuse me on the warming clouds being yeah. a QRP yeah. operator, but I'm yeah. still impressed with the technology. It is a lovely piece of kit, I must admit. Yeah. So, uh, and a lot of people will be very happy with it, I'm sure. But uh, let's say lots of interesting things you've been doing in the last two years. It's been good to catch up with you. Yeah, very, so, um, very busy, but uh, a lot of fun. And if somebody would like to get hold of you or talk to you, uh, email or web address, how would they get hold of you? Well, they can certainly learn about us at flexradio.com. And yep. we have a very active user community with... Uh, more than 3,000 people on the, that are active on the community. Yeah. And, of course, they can email us uh, at sales at Flex Radio or info at flexradio.com. And, and, and away they go. And away they go. And we have distributors all over Europe as well. Uh, that's so. good. So, so, so there you go, guys. No excuse. Well, right. thank you very much for your time, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you. The ICQ Amateur Ham Radio Podcast, serving the amateur ham radio community fortnightly since 2008. So we're joined by Eric Schwartz, Merricraft, W6HHQ, again. Eric, welcome to the podcast. Oh, good afternoon, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problems. We met you last time two years ago at this event here in Germany. So what's been happening with Ellicraft then since we uh, last caught, caught up? Well, we've been quite busy, uh, certainly over the last two years. In addition, I think we talked about the K3S, uh, the new incarnation of the K3 uh, that we introduced a couple of years ago. And that certainly pushed us to a new performance level in the case of uh, uh, HF high performance transceivers. We've done very well with that. And of course, offered some upgrades also that you can take from the K3S in terms of uh, synthesizer cards and IO cards to bring the existing K3s up to that level. We also, uh, during that time frame, uh, came out with the, uh, I think last year, the KX2, which is pretty much the smallest full-on SDR HF handheld transceiver with knobs that you can get out there. It's become the darling of the uh, soda, summits on the air crowd. And I believe that's a, is that a 10 watt, is that a 10 watt radio? Yeah, 10 watt radio. If you're on lower voltage batteries, it'll drop down to 5 watts. Sure. Uh, sideband CW, PSK31, built-in data. It'll even decode your paddle, Morse code paddle, if you want, and send PSK31 to ASCII text. So. <laughs> Fantastic. And I've also seen you've, you've actually brought out some new options for existing products. For example, the P3 pan adapter. I believe you've now got an option for that. Yeah, we, what we did for the P3 pan adapter is we added a little plug-in card. We always had a whole, people always ask us, what's that extra hole for in the back of the P3? And uh, we finally came out with a card for it, a little plug-in card and an external um, directional coupler that gives you the ability on the video to display of the K uh, P3 to uh, display power, SWR, like a watt meter, both digitally and in bar graph format with also a little like a peak hold line on there. Uh, in addition, uh, during transmit, it replaces one of the uh, uh, windows on the P3 monitor temporarily with a transmit waveform display. So you can see if you're overdriving your microphone, how your compression is working, if you have an amplifier in line, if you're overdriving that, if you're flat topping, or if you're on CW, even the rise and fall time of your CW waveform, or if you've got key clicks, things like that. So that's been a neat product, and you can pretty much add it on, uh, you know, fairly low cost on onto the P3. Yeah, it sounds like a very useful uh, feature to have. Certainly, uh, being able to monitor your output is uh, something perhaps not many of us do perhaps too often. So uh, sometimes you have people on the air that clearly are overdriving and things. So uh, having knowing about that is actually really useful. I believe you've also got an amplifier as well that's almost about to release. 
release, is that right? Yes, we've uh, um, announced and uh, actually are rolling into production now with the KPA 1500 watt. That's a, a 1500 watt plus amplifier. And that is actually uh, in our production line right now. Uh, we'll start shipping those, it looks like, before the end of this next month, before the end of August, uh, maybe even earlier. And we are uh, just, uh, we've finished up our FCC testing in the States, where we'll be releasing the product first. Uh, that's all passed. And uh, we're doing a final regulatory rubber stamp portion of it now. Um, there's no problems with it not doing that, but it takes a couple more weeks at least before I can officially take orders and start, start shipping the product. And then we'll be shipping that for several months, uh, and then we'll probably release it in Europe and do our CE testing during that time also. We know the process very well for that. We've done that, of course, with our KPA 500. The uh, 1500 watts very conservatively rated. It uses two LDMOS devices. These are 14 to 1500 watt each individual transistor. Run a pair of those in push-pull in uh, a very conservative design, very large heat sink. They sit on about a 3 8 of an inch copper spreader that they're actually soldered to. There's no thermal grease or anything like that. So you have an absolute bond between them. And then that goes into the output transformers and low-pass filters, of course. Uh, very um, efficient amp, takes uh, right around 50 watts or less to drive it to 1,500 watts plus. And it's um, quite small, too. Not much larger than the KPA 500, maybe an inch and a half wider, three-quarter inch taller, an inch or so deeper. And total weight, I think, uh, as a separate power supply, switching supply, you can have underneath it or under the table. The total weight, I think, of the two is around 36 pounds or so. I'm being, I'm proximate, like plus or minus a few pounds. And carrying them separately, of course, you can carry them over the shoulder um, and for de-expeditions. Ah, so a great idea to split them up so people can, different, different people carry different, different parts of the kit. Oh yeah, carry on in the airplane if you want, things like that. And also it's great, you can put the power supply under the table and save your desk space. So it's, it's an, anyway, oh by the way, it's fully automatic, both for the amplifier with any radio. So it'll follow you around frequency-wise, take band data or just measure the frequency itself. Just give it PTT and RF and you can go. And it has a built-in auto tuner. And best of all, it's got our, our, our signature pin diode uh, solid state TR switching. So it covers the whole. Uh, Sounds whole like area. it's going to be a popular product uh, once, that's, uh, once that's available. Yeah, it's actually a lot of, lot of interest here too. So we're looking forward to getting those out the door. Sounds fantastic. So obviously you've got lots of obviously quite a, lots of innovation going on within Ellicraft. Can you perhaps just take us through how you go about choosing new products to bring to the market and then perhaps you know what's involved in bringing a product to the market right from the idea phase to actually getting it on the shelf in the, in the dealer? Well Chris, uh, as you might guess it takes a lot longer than we wish it would but it, uh, it's never an easy process. Um, engineering is both a creative and a technical uh, design process and you're always coming up with better ideas part way through the process. Sometimes you have to, as we say, shoot the engineers and bring the product to market. But, and I'm being an engineer, I can say that with, with full knowledge. Like I've been shot a few too many times in my life uh, get, getting the product out. But the, um, the key thing we do from the front end, um, in addition to bright ideas that we might come up with, is that we rely on our market feedback from people we meet at shows like Ham Radio Friedrichshafen or Dayton or the, the number of 10 or so shows that we do around the U.S. each year and then the international shows. But also on the internet, which is a wonderful marketing feature feedback mechanism. People are not shy about telling us what they want to see. Our own discussion group, the Ellicraft email list, has close to 5,000 people and we watch ideas pop out there, ideas for improvements, what people think of other radios, and we are constantly making a little list of that and sort of keeping track of the best ones. And eventually, you know, some of those bubble to the top and we'll, we'll choose those too. So that combination gets us to a pretty good selection of products and of course we enhance our products based on feedback from customers and so on too. That whole process can run anywhere from a design standpoint from the very early days. Full transceiver, a big transceiver, can be three to six years. I mean it really depends. Sometimes on the smaller transceivers anywhere from uh, two to three years in that range. So a really huge amount of work even for a small product to, to get it get it actually on the shelf from the idea. Oh, absolutely. But it, you know, it starts out in the early days. You're not full time working on it. We're kicking around ideas. We might do a prototype of some technology in a lab. And you know, people always ask me, well, "When's the?" You know, we introduced the K3. The next question I got is, "When's the K4 coming?" Well, that was the next question, obviously, Eric. <laughs> it always is. And it, and, and what we do is we, we always have advanced technology we're developing in the lab. And so I've got advanced SDR technology, I've advanced transmitter technology, everything there. And the question is when you put the pieces together into a product that we feel is going to be a good marketable product. And so that's always there in the background. And then we're putting, of course, all the software development, which takes a phenomenal amount of time, both for DSP and the control software. We can use some of the pieces we already have, but that technology, we always have to develop new stuff. So that's what stretches that out. 
but it, it depends. So we went from the KX3 to the KX2, that was much quicker because we basically were downsizing the KX3, dropping a few bands off, so on, but the same DSP code was being used. That brought the product out a lot faster, so it works very well. Excellent. Just one last question, uh, Eric. So I've noticed that you've been adding to your, your uh, sales partners here in Europe. Is that having an effect? Are you finding lots of... Uh, European amateurs are now starting to you know, take a Bellacraft products? Oh, absolutely. Well, Europe, certainly out of the North America, in, after North America, uh, the Europe market is by far the you know, largest market that we sell into. And that's why I started coming to Friedrichshafen, oh gosh, uh, I'm going to be incorrect here, but probably seven, eight years ago in that range, uh, maybe even a little bit longer. You know, sometime around the K3S uh, introduction, I think, or just before that. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a key market for us. Certainly Germany here is a, is a large economy. We do very well here. The UK is a big for us, but we sell all throughout Europe. We have distributors and we've added new, new distributors, most recently one in Switzerland, but we've got distributors in Germany, UK, and down in, um, in Italy also. Our regional warranty repair center is in Italy and Bologna, and he covers the whole, whole European area. It's a great area. We sell direct everywhere in the world from Ellicraft, but for people that want to touch and feel and have a local uh, language person supporting them, we uh, do that too. So the combination's been a really good combination for us, and, and we do a great job supporting those guys too. That's great. Well, Eric, thank you very much for your time once again, and I wish you best of luck for the show. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Right. Hi, everybody. I'm here with Kenji Asano from ICOM. And um, we're here to talk about what ICOM has got for us this year, what's new. Uh, but I'd like to start with a little bit of history of ICOM. I believe ICOM has been producing amateur radio equipment for a long time. Yes, Ross. Yeah. Now, so we produce from 1964 to continue to, to produce the amateur radio. Yeah, because I can remember when I was starting in amateur radio, my first rig was an ICOM. Ah, I see. And things have changed an awful lot in the meantime. But uh, I think you're still on the forefront of... Uh, of amateur radio in, in, in producing modern radios. Um, I personally have an IC7300, so I'm very oh, much, thank you very much. Uh, a, fan, a fan of that radio. And, mm-hmm. and I know you have here at Friedrichshafen today the 7610. Oh, yes. And tell us a little bit about the, the 7610. Yeah. So that's just coming in this uh, first time is bringing to the European. So we. Uh, we are we uh, uh, very happy to introduce the 7610 in this fair. Yeah, and, and I'm, we're actually stood in front of it. Obviously, it's an audio podcast, so people can't see this, but it's a larger rig than the 7300, but still with a, a very big LCD display on it. And, you know, it, it looks like a top of the line rig, but it's, it's, it's mid range for ICOM, isn't it? It's in the middle of your range. Yes, it should be mid range because, uh, you know, the RMD, our dynamic range of the, uh, just, uh, very close frequency. So mm-hmm. 7300 has 100 dB for t- separated for, from 2 kilohertz. Yeah. 7610 has a, even the dual receiver, so they have a 110 dB. Okay, good. So our most expensive 7851, that is a 116. Oh, God, that is a little bit better, yeah. better than this. Yeah, but, but even 110 dB, that is yeah. already so very high specification. Yeah, compared to radios of a few years ago, the, these are really world-class radios, and I suspect will become uh, the, the radio of choice for a lot of contesters and DXers. Yes, even 7800. Mm-hmm. It's a previous very expensive radio, but yep. then those radio has an RLDR is 84 dB. Right. So, so 7600 is already better. so big, and yeah. uh, 7610 is so much is and a good specification. Yeah, good. And uh, uh, as well as the 7610, I believe ICOM's just announced a new dual band mobile. Yes. ID 4100. 4100. Yes. Yeah. And to tell us a little bit about that, is that. Um, is that already available? I know the 7610 were waiting for the actual release <laughs> yes. date, which yes. you've already told me you can't tell me. So, so we hope but, it the will 40, but the 4100 is actually for sale, no? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a mobile? It's mobile. Mobile, so our D-Star radios. Right, yes. and 2 meters and 70 two meters centimeters. And, centimeters. Yeah. Yeah. and 50 watts? No, no, no. That, that, uh, ah, sorry, sorry. 50 watts, yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah for the, for the uh, 4100. And uh, the other thing I've seen here new is the, the receiver. You have a, a very wide band receiver. Yes. Which, when you first look at it, it looks rather like an IC7300, but uh, I'm told it's got the advantages of the receivers in the 7610. It's a lot more sensitive than the 7300, mm-hmm. as well as wider range. Yeah. 
the not safe, uh, sensitive, that is uh, strong than for now from interference. That mm. is a good receiver uh, performance. Okay, good. And and that, that receiver is also available today in Europe. It's been released, the, the so R... R1600. Yeah. Yes. So that's uh, not available yet, but... Uh, we, ah, okay. Yes, it will, uh, we already uh, launched to the other countries. Mm. Now in Europe, it's uh, under the uh, regulation process. Specification yes. taker process, so then, yeah. but uh, it will come soon. Yeah. Under, okay. under those process. Understand. Yeah. Okay. And um, yes, uh, I also noticed that you're actually a sponsor of the World Radio Team Championship next year. The WRTC 2018, ICOM are, are one of the sponsors. Yeah, we have a sponsorship, but uh, not so strongly, sorry. Not, not, not a major sponsor, yeah, but a sponsor yeah. anyway, because I've seen always that ICOM and the other RAM manufacturers, but ICOM especially like to be involved in many parts of amateur radio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hope that uh, that goes on for many years to come. Yeah. I'm sorry. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I wish, uh, I wish you... Uh, mm -hmm. All the success in selling some radios today, or through your dealers selling the radios. Yeah. And maybe we'll see uh, see something next year that's different as well. We'll we'll wait and see. Should be yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank yeah, you very much. Any time, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, that wraps up our uh, special extra episode here, talking to the manufacturers who were in attendance at the Friedrich Schavenham radio show there uh, in southern Germany. I think the uh, most impressive thing there by some of the interviewees there is that where English isn't their first language and they've been able to uh, certainly converse with us better than we could have done in German or, or Japan, Japanese or one of those sort of languages. So uh, it's a thank you very much for their time in getting involved and the representatives from uh, Yesu, Kenwood, Flex Radio, Elecraft and Icon, we thank you for uh, taking part in our show. Now, the Yesu uh, repeater announcement certainly got a lot of interest on social media when we uh, broke the story from the show. Uh, in relation to the specs of uh, of that um, repeater they're releasing. After speaking to uh, Paul Bigwood there from Yesu, uh, Dad, uh, what's, your, uh, what's your thoughts now in relation to what they're doing with that repeater? And uh, does it serve a need? Does it fill the right gaps? Does it have the right technology included, etc., for uh, what you would have hoped it would be? Well, going forward, Colin, oh, there's been uh, quite a bit of a hysteria going on on the internet, but going forward, it is actually an upgrade. Yes, it does wires X, but yes, they are implementing new ways of doing things. And, you know, you've got to look at what is right for you. So I think what Yesu are doing is they're, they're making uh, a couple of different repeaters available. And uh, you, you choose the one that fits what you require to do. So the important one from Paul was that uh, the DR1 is not being discontinued. The DR1 will run alongside the DR2. And, you know, the DR2 is going to be certainly an enhancement to uh, system fusion. And, you know, only time will tell. We need to get them out there to uh, see how well they work and all those sort of things. And I think that uh, at the moment... The initial discussions that coming out of Japan were that certain things weren't going to happen. And then within 24 hours, Paul was told something different. So uh, that's why we record the interview later, so that we can give you the correct information. So that's why I say on that one. No problem. So now, reflecting back on the show, what actually uh, was interest from you, from your perspective, of uh, the kit you saw uh, being uh, shown off at the show? Truthfully... I'm a QRP operator. However, there was some gorgeous kit on all of the stands. Every one of them. The, the, the five manufacturers we interviewed today certainly had beautiful pieces of equipment on that fulfilled the need. And I would have been hard-pressed if, if I'd got um, a big checkbook ready to buy a radio, an, an expensive high-end radio, I would have been very difficult to, to which one I was going to choose. And, I, and I'd probably be still sitting here, I mean, I don't know which one I'd go. The quality of all of them is good. The spec is good. And I think going forward, um, you know, whatever radio fits your needs, guys. But uh, there's plenty of good ones out there. 
Yeah, it sounds like uh, it's, if you have money in your pocket, it's, uh, it's a good time to be an amateur. There's a lot of good kit out there for people to enjoy. So uh, it's good to hear that the manufacturers are uh, working away hard there in, uh, say, bringing this great kit now onto the market for us. So, uh, yeah, certainly, guys, check out. And if, certainly if uh, you've heard of anything of interest from, uh, say, the manufacturers today, uh, check out their websites uh, and find out more about their products. Well, I'd like to thank uh, yourself, um, Dad Martin, M1MRB, W9ACQ, Chris Howard, uh, Mike Zero, Tango Charlie Hotel, and Ed DD5 Lima Papa for their interviews there at the Free Charm Show. Guys, I hope you really appreciated uh, this extra episode uh, outside of our usual uh, release schedule of the ICQ podcast. As always, we'd uh, ask you to consider us by uh, sending donations our way to keep us out at free at icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. Follow us on uh, Twitter at Colin Butler at M1MRB. Um, of course, also check out the Facebook group or sign up to the mailing list to be kept up to date with all the latest amateur ham radio news that's going on in the hobby. Well, normally I'd say we're doing so in a fortnight's time, Dad, but we'll be doing this in a week's time with uh, episode 244 and our final roundup from uh, Friedrich Sharvin. So in the meantime, uh, as I say, I'm going to uh, send you off to uh, make that cup of tea for Mum, find her a biscuit, and who knows, maybe get the planning books out and start considering next year's show. We certainly will, and uh, you're right, we're doing it in a week's time. Well, your sister's here tonight uh, with your mum, which is quite nice. So your mum's home tonight, so I haven't got to make her a cup of tea just yet, but we'll maybe make her a cup of tea a bit later. So I'd like to say 73s to everybody, and we'll be back in a week's time on our normal schedule. 73. 73s all. 73s all. 73s all. 73s all. 73s all. 